Good evening, and welcome to the Cozy Storyteller. My name is Emily Wren. Tonight's story is entitled The Family Tree, and is written by me, Emily Wren. Please like, comment, and subscribe, and gently boop the little bell icon. That way, you'll get a notification every time I upload a new story. This helps grow the channel so that I can write and read new stories to help you fall asleep or just relax. So turn off the light and snuggle down deep in your blankets with your favorite plush animal and enjoy the story. An ancient tree grew in the wild meadow across the street. It grew gnarled and whorled, the twisting shapes like rivers of brown and black. It clung to the edge of a ledge of earth, the roots exposed into a network of wooden lacework. Every morning, afternoon, and evening, I would gaze at it past the warbled old glass and the red and white jacket curtains. We kept each other company out here in the back country, the tree and I. I lived in the house where my grandma lived and her grandma before her. Each generation would carve initials in the trunk, climbing high and higher with each change of a new face moving in and cleaning up the old house into a new home for a new generation and a new child to discover the ancient tree and carve three letters into the bark with an old penknife found forgotten in the back of the junk drawer in the kitchen. There weren't many people out this ways. Never had been, never would be. The only thing worth living here was the way time slowed and the measure of it wasn't in minutes, but moments. You start to notice the little things like the way the golden dandelion heads close when the daylight fades into twilight and be available for the big things like coming out on the back porch right before the break of a foggy dawn with a cup of hot coffee that warms your chilly fingers. And there she is. A young doe standing in the middle of your patch of gourds over a kicked in pumpkin with a smudge of orange still on her muzzle as she stares straight through you with those big brown eyes rimmed in delicate black lashes. Or the time when you wake up terrified in the middle of one of the first nights of the first week there alone to a ruckus on the porch where you had forgotten to close up the trash can right. And you flick on the back light to find five masked faces staring back at you before they scatter in a flash of striped tails. The next night, you're prepared with some cheap bologna you got at the corner store. And before long, the raccoons begin to trust you enough to take the food right from your hands. Or when you find the baby swamp rabbit all huddled up in one of your old boots. Or the sleepy screech owl blinking down at you from his hideaway in the rafters of your front porch, or the tiny kitten all alone meowing out for another warm body in the world, a kitten so small she fits in the palm of your hand, and you wag her around in the pocket of your cardigan so you can feed her every two hours with goat's milk fresh from a nanny goat from your small herd. And somehow the kitten's grown so big she warms your whole lap on those late nights, reading the length and breadth of all the books in the house, or all those moments where you fill up a wooden crate from the back of the shed in the dead of winter with fruit, vegetables, seed, and hay, then leave it in the woods and hide in the camouflage shelter you built out of fallen branches and a tarp, all snuggled up underneath several blankets and layers of thick flannel work shirts. With a large thermos filled with spiced hot apple cider you made just that morning, it all adds up to a whole lot of nothings all strung together, but those nothings are worth more than all the somethings in the world. I moved back to the house in my early twenties, 
Grandma had just gone from our lives, one moment making her famous homemade strawberry cake that didn't look so pretty so you knew it tasted good, and then the next just gone. The first day, I went and visited with the ancient tree across the street in the meadow and searched the park all over until I found my three initials carved so crudely in the trunk. I'd never used a penknife before then, but when I found it while staying over at Grandma's for the summer in that junk drawer in the kitchen, it was as if I knew its purpose was to leave my mark on this place. Grandma showed me where her initials were, but only I could scramble up from branch to branch to find it. The tree grows a lot in fifty-some years. And I think now of all those moments remembered in the measure between Grandma's initials and mine, and I wonder how they must all fit in that space of new growth, for fifty-some years between seemed so small to contain what had been so much. My mother never carved her initials in the tree, nor any of her brothers. Only Grandma and me. We staked out our claim with that penknife, just as her grandmother did before her. Somehow the tree just knows, and somehow you know in a language spoken only between tree and child. I'd forgotten my initials, but I never forgot this place, for it had carved itself on that part of me at the center of every other ring I had grown up over the years, that part of me that was still me, no matter how much I'd grown up. And as the tree grew, I grew. Somehow the house grew with a new love and a new generation. On a sunny summer afternoon, as I went to go visit the tree, the grown kitten following close at my heels, her tail pointed straight up on official business, I found a fresh row of initials badly carved with that penknife in the back of the junk drawer. I rubbed my fingers over the rough surface and gazed up to see with wonder how little the space was between this new row and where I could just make out my initials up by the crook of a branch. I turned and looked out over the wildflowers growing free and happy in the meadow, and there they are, three children running wild and staking their claims.